Good morning, everyone. Welcome to First Things First. I'm Jenna Wolf. That's Nick Wright. Kevin Wilds. Brian Westbrook is with us on a Wednesday morning. Questions we are pondering today. Is James Harden's legacy on the line during these playoffs? Are LeBron and AD about to add a third superstar this offseason? And is Carson Wentz mm. overrated? That's where we start. We're sticking no. with quarterbacks for our top story today. How good is your quarterback? compared to your backup quarterback? It's an interesting question. So our friends over at Fox Bet have assigned a spread value, if you will, to every starting quarterback when compared to a replacement level backup. In other words, how much is each quarterback actually worth when it comes to the scoreboard? So let's take a look. Patrick Mahomes on top here, worth eight and a half points more than a replacement level backup. But check out the bottom five. Jared Stidham, dead last in the NFL, worth one and a half points less than a replacement I mean, backup. So, Nick, wow. we're going to start right there with the seemingly newly minted quarterback of the New England Look Patriots. His name Look is Jared this. Stidham. Yeah. We, yeah, he is. We all know it. We haven't really seen him play it out yet, though. How, how should Patriots fans be feeling? Or let me just say this. How worried should Patriots fans be about this? Well, this it's not like this is new information. I'm not smiling because I'm rooting for the Patriots' demise. I picked them, and I'm still picking them to win the division, to win 10 games, and back to the postseason. But I'm smiling because this is, to me, at least slightly further vindication for something I said a couple months ago in relation to Cam Newton and where he should go, and that is that New England has the single worst quarterback situation in football, and I'm not sure how anyone could argue otherwise. The only other team that is going to attempt what New England is attempting this year, which is to go into the season without either an established starter, a veteran that's been around the league or as a starter, or a blue chip draft pick, is Jacksonville. And on that graphic, the only other team whose quarter starting quarterback right now is worth less than a replacement level backup is Jacksonville. Every other team in the league has either spent high draft equity or a lot of salary cap dollars on the quarterback position. The Patriots are deciding to go another way. Like, I don't even know what the argument against them having the worst quarterback situation in football is. And I think it's telling to remind, remind the audience the quarterbacks drafted around Jared Stidham, the two drafted immediately before him and the two drafted immediately after him, how their teams looked at their quarterback situations. You had Will Greer, who was taking 60-some picks before Jared Stidham. Carolina this offseason said, my God, we need Teddy Bridgewater. You had right before Jared Stidham was taken, Ryan Finley. Cincinnati this offseason said, we've got to draft a quarterback number one overall. The Chargers took Easton Stick right after Jared Stidham. They went out and drafted Justin Herbert. And the Eagles took Clayton Thorson a few picks after Jared Stidham. They drafted Jalen Hurts to be their backup because they're not even comfortable with Thorson being their second string quarterback. Like, that is the neighborhood Jared Stidham lives in. So Wilds, of course, it's the worst quarterback situation in football. Of course, he's ranked dead last on this list. Oh, I don't know what else rolls, it could be. Nick. Look at his eye rolls. Okay. All right. Here we go. So to Nick, and if you write a football blog, or perhaps you have a podcast, or perhaps you do a show from your basement with a very narrow bookshelf behind you, I have one question for you. Do you know more about football than Bill Belichick? If the answer is yes, if you if you do a catalog of your of your brain and your experience, and the answer is yes, then go to Patriots.com, go over to the Human Resources link, and call up Robert Kraft and say, "Hey, great news! You found the next Belichick. In fact, I'm better than Bill Belichick." But if you do an honest assessment of how much you know about football compared to Bill Belichick, you would probably come up and say no. And if the answer is no, which it is then all I'm saying is treat Jared Stidham and Bill Belichick like you do every other aspect of your life. So when you go to a restaurant and you say, excuse me, sommelier, can you recommend a wine? And the sommelier says, yes, this is my favorite wine. This is what I'm recommending. It's a wonderful wine from Auburn. You can't say, not only is that wine not good, it's the worst wine in the building. Out of 32 wines, it's the last wine in the whole place. Secondly, 
if you're on a plane and the, pl and the captain, Captain Solenberger, says, hey, you know what? Little hiccup in the plans, everybody. We're going to land this baby in the Hudson River. You can't say, well, stop the presses, Captain Sully. This is the worst place to land the plane. You can't land the plane in the river. Yeah, I know you can't land the plane in the river. Andy Reid can't land the plane in the river. Pete Carroll can't land the plane in the river. But Captain Sully can, and so can Bill Belichick, Nick. So I know it doesn't make sense so, on paper, okay. but if you trust Bill Belichick and you say that he's the best coach of all time, then it makes okay. perfect sense. That's why okay. I'm for Jarrett the Javelin. Right. Go Patriots 2020. All right. Okay, so here's the problem <laughs> with both of your analogies. And I'll break them down quickly and then I'll kick it to Jenna so Brian can get involved. But the problem with your analogies in reverse order is Sully, Go. when he took off from LaGuardia, the plan wasn't, guys, we're going to the Hudson. He, he, he had to, in real time, adjust. We're not saying the Patriots midseason, oh my God, quarterback went down, you got to go with Stidham. They are, they are taking off from LaGuardia and Sully's announcing to the cabin, guys, instead of going to Miami, we're actually going to go 600 meters to the west so we can land in the river because I want to <laughs> try it. That, that's what the Patriots are doing. And to use your Somalia analogy in defense of Belichick, yes. If you go to fancy restaurant and you say, I've got $250 to spend, how should I spend it? What has happened here is they've said, well, you've got to have the, you've got to have the raw bar. You've got to have the steak. Our lobster mashed is amazing. Now that only leaves you $9. So all we can give you is our house <laughs> red. And I'll be honest, it's not very good, but the rest of the meal will be so good. good it'll offset it. So that's that's the further furthering back. your analogy, Wilds. Go ahead, Jenna. And, and let me just add one more point. Don't forget, Belichick was ready to jump off of Tom Brady a couple years ago when he brought in Garoppolo. Exactly. He was like, well, I think we've seen the end. Let's move on. So maybe Belichick isn't the absolute best at evaluating where talent is at what point. But, Brian, let's bring you into the conversation. Is this fair to Stidham? Are you on Team Nick? Or are you on Team Wilds with this? Well, come on, Brian. It, it's hard to actually agree with Kevin, but on this case, I do. Him and Captain Sully Boom! Uh, have convinced me. And, and, and this is the reason why. <laughs> I think that this whole list obviously does not take into account the head coach and the offensive coordinator. And for New England, those guys have been together for a very long time, and they've done a great job of getting talent out of places where you didn't think you're going to get talent from. And so this is what Bill Belichick knows. And that's similar to the 49ers in a way this past season. They're going to have a great game plan. They're going to out scheme people. They're going to out design people. They're going to put their offense, their quarterback in a great position to be successful, despite whether he, whether he has great talent or not. So he's going to be in a great position to be successful, and it's going to be up to Stidham to do that. They're going to try to establish the run game. They try to do that towards the end of Tom Brady's tenure there. And I think that this year, Sony Michelle, that offensive game will get going as far in as far as in the run game. And lastly, you're going to have great defense up there in, um, in, in New England, just like the 49ers last year. And with that, I think that they could bring Jared Stidham along a little bit slower than other teams may think. They're not going to ask him to go out there and win football games. And so, yeah, I, I kind of believe that with Jared Stidham and his four career passing attempts, two of them being complete, one of them being an uh, interception. He, he there, certainly deserves this 1.5 rating or negative 1.5 rating. But I, I do think that you have to give some credit to Bill Belichick and Josh McDaniels and their ability to get the best out of players, no matter what position they play. There you go, Team All Wilds. Right, so let's go back and talk. Yeah, talk about the other end of the spectrum. We mentioned Mahomes earlier. It's funny you and Wilds are on absolute opposite ends mm -hmm. of the spectrum with this one. Mahomes eight and a half worth eight and a half points more than replacement level quarterback. Nick, does that sit comfortably with you? Does that sound about right? Well, I, listen to credit Fox Bet. That is what happened last year when Mahomes w went down. It was an eight point difference between he and Matt Moore, and Matt Moore might be a little bit better than the average replacement level backup. But I think this is a, a, tad, a tad low. 
I think Mahomes is actually probably worth a little bit more than a touchdown and a field goal. I think he's probably 10 and a half points better than the average replacement level player. He's clearly the best quarterback in football and clearly should be the tops on this list. But I would say he's probably about 10 and a half. And I know they had Russell Wilson, too. I, I actually wonder if the way Seattle runs their team, if Russell is actually, his value is muted. And Lamar, on the other hand, if he shouldn't be higher uh -huh. because they have built that entire team around his skill set, Wilds. But yeah, I'm eight and a half at a minimum for Mahomes. I think it's probably closer to 10, 10 and a half. Back here, first things first, with Brian Westbrook, we're drawing a blank. Two months after Todd Gurley and the Falcons agreed on a deal, the all-pro running back has finally passed his physical, which prompted Atlanta's offensive coordinator, Dirk Cutter, to say, quote, when healthy, you could argue he's the best back in the game. Mildly concerning, considering he said that after they'd already signed him. Nick, Cutter's comments on Gurley are blank. Well, I think they're accurate, but I think they're sadly accurate because the, the win healthy caveat of that is the whole game here with Todd. We know win healthy, he was the best running back in the game. We know win healthy, he was the single biggest piece of the best offense or second best offense in football a couple years ago. We know all that. The problem is, is he ever going to be healthy again? Was he dealing with an injury or was he dealing with a condition? Was he dealing with something chronic? Unfortunately, I fear it's the latter and not the former. And so I don't think we're ever going to be able to see that version of Todd Gurley again. I hope we do. He's a great guy that was on an all-time great track early on in his career. But arthritis in the knee, Brian, is arthritis in the knee. And it seems like a terrible spot for a running back to be in. So I think these comments are sadly accurate. You know, I think these comments are carefully constructed. And I think just to your uh, your point, they are true. Uh, 2018, Todd Gurley, over 1,200 rushing yards, 59 receptions. 2017, over 1,300 rushing yards and 64 receptions. So he can hurt you in a run game in the past game. But 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 you like you mentioned, he hasn't been healthy. And, and I've dealt with chronic knee injuries. And so he can still get to that level. It's just not, he's, he's not going to be able to do it as often. That's going to be the big time concern. And I think it's a, a great thing for Atlanta because here's the deal. They're not going to have to ask him to carry the ball 256 times this year. They're going to give him about 200 carries, quality carries. They're going to throw him the ball out of the backfield. Defenses will have to worry about Julio and Matt Ryan. I think this is a great place to talk to him. So, Jenna, my takeaway wasn't about Gurley. It was about Cam because it looks like physicals are open. Reports are you can't have physical at the team facility, but you can go to the home office of the team physician. So for Cam, this is great because all we've been hearing is wait till we open up, wait till we can get a physical. Well, physicals are open, so the window for Cam gets a little bit wider. I wonder if we're going to see any movement before the season. So he should get signed any minute now. Uh, on to Jameis Winston, who I got to tell you guys, Jameis Winston really impressed me yesterday. Coming off that 30 interception season, coming off getting signed as a backup in the league, and yet the guy still really believes in himself. He said, quote, if a team doesn't think I'm good enough to be a starter, let me earn my way back up. I've done it my whole life. He went on to say, historically, I'm one of the best quarterbacks to play the game. You go do you, Jameis. He also went vegan and lost 17 pounds and had LASIK surgery, but that's different. Uh, Nick, Winston's comments oh, he went vegan. are blank. Went vegan, yeah. I'm gonna say half, I, I'm gonna say half true. Like, you know that PolitiFact truth meter where it's like true, mostly true, half true, mostly false, pants on fire. This one's right in the middle because the, it, it half of Jameis Winston's career is some of the best quarterbacking we've ever seen. What he did at Florida State, his raw yardage and touchdown numbers through the first five yards, five years of his career, all of that screams, this is an all-timer. The problem is the other half, which is the amount of time he gives the ball to the opposition, screams, this is one of the worst quarterbacks we've ever seen. So it's exactly down the middle. I get the point he's making. The problem is, even when he was winning the Heisman in a national championship, turnovers were a problem they got even worse in the nfl and so i get the point james is making and i applaud his self-confidence but the the other half almost takes all the progress away from the first half so these comments are only half true brian 
these comments are uh, imprecise. They, they just are. And I, I think to your point is that the 5,100 passing yards is impressive. His ability to have uh, the eighth most yards in the season, that, that's just great. It's the interception is the problem. And I think when you read the article, it's clear. Jameis Winston wants to win games all by himself. And in this league, you don't have to win it all by yourself. Get the ball to your playmakers. When you have big-time players like Godwin, where you had Mike Evans that you had, O.J. Howard that you have, get the ball into those guys' hands. Don't try to win the game all by yourself. As good as Patrick Mahomes is, he wouldn't be as good if he didn't have the playmaking ability of Travis Kelsey, Tyreek Hill, and Damian Williams. Mm -hmm. He trusts those guys to get the ball into their hands. Jameis Winston has to. He, Jameis Winston has to learn that if he wants to be successful in this league. So this is the, I went with unconventional here because this is the quote that's unconventional. We've seen a lot of unconventional training videos that Jameis is putting out. So this quote is right along with them. These are some of our greatest hits. This is the old, uh, if your tow truck yeah, uh, operator is busy, you can always call Jameis Winston. He'll push you right out of there. Brian doesn't think this works. I think, it, I think well, it's very it looks impressive. Like, it looks like his trainer I, I is thought... pushing the gas just a little bit or he's pushing the truck no, down. No, no, him. no. Either one. No, no this is the old Miley Cyrus drill. It's very famous in the uh, NFL. <laughs> it's uh, a wrecking ball. You throw a wrecking that. ball at him. You move around if this ever pops up. <laughs> yeah. Whoa, miss it. Boom. That happens sometimes. <laughs> and this is the old uh, throwback one, Florida State baseball no team. No, Patrick Mahomes was a baseball player. Russell Wilson played baseball. Jameis played baseball. There's a direct connection there to great you, football Nick? players and great Wait, baseball well, players. Hold on. I, uh, listen, real Brian. I understand the push in the truck, and I absolutely understand the dodge in the wrecking ball. W what possible use does this have for a quarterback, Brian? Well, the thing I'm thinking about here when I'm watching the video is the hips. And watch the hips right here at the top, the hips turning. And I re just remember that video of Dak right before the game, the pregame, of of him getting his yeah. hips going, activating his core. I think that's what Jameis Winston is trying to do here in this drill. Yeah. The baseball is just to throw us all off, Nick. That's the swing of the bat. All right, let's move on to Carson Wentz now. By the way, totally rooting for that guy. You, you go do your wrecking ball. Uh, the Eagles franchise quarterback is looking to get over the hump, stay healthy, prove that he's worth the $128 million that the team is currently paying him. Well, a recent column in the big league was titled, Carson Wentz is massively underrated. And it got us thinking at our 5 a.m. daily Zoom meeting, which almost always now starts at 5.04. Nick, the way Wentz should be wow, perceived the by Nick. the rest of the NFL is blank. Shot at Nick right there. Listen. <laughs> it's a little shot. It's a little shot. I, I get to the meeting. Nick. Hold on a second. <laughs> I get to the meeting nearly every day at 5.05. So guess what? The meeting starts at 5.05. <laughs> yeah. If you're yeah. getting there earlier, that's oh, on you. That's it's not like there's hit and miss. Some days I'm there at 458. Worse, Every day it's 505. That's, that's on true. you. Now, to discuss the Carson Wentz topic, <laughs> with respect to the folks of the big lead, this is nonsense. Carson Wentz should be perceived by the rest of the NFL exactly the way he is. There are six quarterbacks in this league that everyone understands at this current moment are better than him. Mahomes, Lamar, Russell, Deshaun, Rodgers, and Breeze. Not necessarily in that order. Then there, there's then another bucket of quarterbacks that Wentz is in. Wentz, Dak, Matt Ryan, Kirk Cousins, that tier. He's somewhere between 7 to 11 in this league. That's who he is. That's what most people think he is. So I don't think he's underrated. I don't think he's overrated. I think he's the rare athlete that is currently properly rated, Brian. So I disagree with the folks at the big league. Well, Nick, you've certainly proven that you're not a team player. If the meeting starts at 5, you got to get there at 5. That, that's obvious. Boom. Be on Thank the you, Brian. Be that's, that, that's how meetings work. But as but far as Carson Wentz, he's statue dependent. And I'm going to tell you why. We all have recognized Carson is an, ex an exceptional player. He can do all the things, make all the throws that the quarterback needs to be able to make. He's athletic. He can move around in the pocket. He can do all those things. The problem is that he hasn't won any games in the postseason. He got hurt this past season, and he's chasing the ghost of Nick Foles. Nick Foles, the backup quarterback, came into Philly as a starter. The Carson Wentz went down, and at that point, he went on and led his team to win the Super Bowl. It kind of reminds me of LeBron James 
chasing the statue, the ghost, the shadow of Michael Jordan. Oh boy, now until, the show just went off the rails. <laughs> until uh, <laughs> Carson Wentz finds a way to get outside of Nick Foles' shadow and win some playoff games, he's always going to be shadow dependent, statue dependent. All right. I went, uh, our researcher Dusty is a huge Eagles fan. And I said, Dusty, we got this Wentz question. He said, can you send me your favorite stat? So he sent me this, he sent this in the mail. U.S. Post Office doing a great job. <laughs> sent it at 5.04 when the meeting started. Got here today. It said, uh, it, Wentz is so injured. It's a like Karnak thing. Wentz is so injured. Ready, Nick? Wentz is so injured. Oh, jeez. Yeah. It's easier when really Johnny Carson did it. There's different envelopes in the 80s. Wentz is so injured. If Wentz is so injured, why does he have more starts since 2016 than Rodgers, Goff, Big Ben, and Cam, and only two fewer than Breeze, according to Dusty, our researcher, and the amazing Karnak? Oh, oh. No, but so, that's yeah, actually a good I, stat. Can I just say, it's a good know, stat. The Dusty. problem is, once you're labeled injury-prone, it's so hard to overcome that, and I'm afraid that he has oh. been labeled just that, even though it is a great stat, Dusty. All right, on to Baltimore Ravens backup quarterback Robert Griffin III, who recently said, quote, I want to be a starter again. I'm 30 years old, and quarterbacks are playing into their 40s now. Well, RG3 joined us here a few weeks ago and said he'd love a chance to show the league that he can still lead a team. Nick, you doubted him before. He called you out on it. So, you know, be careful here. The chances RG3 becomes a starting quarterback again are blank. Well, I, listen, I don't I don't need to be careful here, but R- Robert, with respect to him, he was very adamant that I was part of the reason he didn't get a starting opportunity a few years back. So if he does get one in the future, I hope I get some of the credit because of this answer, because I think his chances of becoming a starting quarterback quarterback are increasing by the day because the NFL is moving more and more towards his style of quarterbacking. He's absolutely right that quarterbacks' careers now go into their mid and late 30s for Breeze and Brady, even into their early 40s. And for a long time, we heard NFL front offices claim almost as a reason not to sign quarterbacks such as RG3. Well, they can't be our backup because we need a guy that can play the same system as the starter. But now that there's more and more quarterbacks playing that type of system, he could go somewhere else other than Baltimore as a backup and one day be the starter. You would think those opportunities would be wider now than ever before. So I think it's, inc- I don't know if it's going to happen, but I think it's more viable now than at any point since he suffered his last major injury. So Brian, I think it's increasing by the day. I think his chances of being becoming a starting quarterback in the NFL are slight. And, and, and I say that in a, in a, in a sad sense because I love what RG3 was able to do his early years there in Washington. But I, I just wonder, do teams say, well, he's 30 now. Is he still going to have the, have the ability to run around and make people miss, similar to what he was able to do early on in his career? He certainly never had the same type of wiggle as Lamar Jackson. And now at an a, a older age, is he able to do it? That's why I'm still wondering if teams will look at him as a starting quarterback. I think his chances are slight. I I hope they're great. Um, We saw that Week 17 win against the Steelers. It was the Ravens rested a ton of guys, and they still got the win in the rain. Had some had some good throws there, and after the uh, in the locker room, there's just a real great team atmosphere. So I think he put it together on the field and in the locker room. We know he's a great presence, so I'm rooting for him, Jenna. We should mention he's got one more season as Lamar's back up there in uh, Baltimore before he does become a free agent. So let's see what he can do. All right, to some basketball now. Will James Harden's legacy be on the line during the Rockets' title push? That's next. This is First Things First. Back here with Chris Broussard talking some hoops. So yesterday, our guy Nick set the internet on fire when he listed James Harden Ooh. as the number one player with the most to gain by winning a title this season. Here's Nick's full top ten list for your reference. Meanwhile, Harden's boss, Rockets GM, and friend of the show, Del Morey, had this to say about James Harden. Take a listen. You know, we've worked together for eight or nine years now, and I couldn't have a better partner uh, to try and win a title with. And in fact, most days I wake up saying I've let him down because I haven't gotten him, got him the right players to win a title. Nick, so let me ask you, what is on the line for James Harden this playoff run? Well, it's the only way he can actually tangibly elevate his standing 
in NBA history is not only a finals run, but a championship during his prime right now is as good a time as any. Like, what, what James Harden, his regular season statistical profile, the All-NBAs, the top two MVP finishes, where he has more than Kobe, more than Shaq, the same number of MVPs, by the way, as each of those guys, and the scoring, the, the points per game stuff, to go along with the fact that he's a seven rebound, eight assist a night guy, it is of an all-time, all-time top tier great. But the fact that he's only played in one finals, he played in that one finals when he was not one of the main top two guys on the team, it was obviously KD and Russ, and the fact that in Houston, he has just consistently been unable to beat the juggernaut that was Golden State will always be held against him. But if they win the title, Wilds, it, you have to start talking about him as one of the 20 greatest players ever. Like, I, I, I'm very adamant that the top 14 players of all time is a list that is almost impossible to break into. Maybe Kevin Durant will, maybe somebody will, but... LeBron, Michael, Kareem, Magic, Russell, Wilt, Duncan, Kobe, Bird, West, Oscar, Akeem, Shaq, Moses. There's your 14. I happen to believe number 15 is Dr. J. And then we've got a, a group of 10 guys, Steph, KD, Dirk, Elgin, Bob Pettit for the old timers, Barkley, Steph, Dwayne Wade. Harden not only can move into that group, Wilds, he can move above four or five of those guys I just mentioned because he already has accomplished more in the regular season than most of those guys. And a lot of those guys only have the one title. Some of them have none. Carl Malone's in that group as well. And so that's what's on the line for him. I, that's why I think he has more to gain than anybody, Wilds. Yeah, so I, I think this list is 100% accurate, Nick. It feels a little Dirk-esque. Like, if Dirk didn't win that championship, I don't know where he would fall on your top 100 players, but I think he makes a huge leap. Now, the question is, Broussard, if they don't win, like, how often are we going to keep on running this ISO ball thing and say next year, next year, next year? They're all in on ISO ball this year more than ever because now we've got not only Harden playing ISO ball, Russ is playing ISO ball. They're the top two ISOs in the entire league. Dame Lillard is third, which is another playoff problem. And then the biggest damning thing that I saw, this was last year, and it was a pregame interview. It was Scottie Pippen. Um, talking to P.J. Tucker, and there was a moment of raw honesty that was just great television, Broussard. And they were just, and uh, P.J. was like, yeah, our points per possession, and da-da-da. And Pippen was like, miss me with all that. I've played a lot of years in this league, and I'll tell you this. If I see you for seven games, you're not going to win playing that style because you're predictable. Broussard, I think this is the make-or-break year for the Rockets. I love Daryl, and I think he showed great leadership here. But I don't know how often we keep on running this system if it doesn't work. It's definitely the make or break year for the Rockets. Look, they brought in Russell Westbrook to win a championship. They didn't bring him in to go to the second round, the third round, be the third best team yep. in the West. And that's what they are at best. So what's on the line for James Harden? Nothing. Because they have no chance oh. of winning the championship. This is madness, Nick. Oh, my Nick. God. That, Look, I agree, I agree wholeheartedly. <laughs> I agree wholeheartedly with you that if somehow James Harden could lead these Rockets to the title, it would raise his legacy without question. I also, though, disagree. I think Stephs and Durant are in that top 15 somewhere. But anyway, Harden, they can't win it. Yeah, of course if he wins it. But if Luka wins it too, his stock's going to raise. You know, if Jason Tatum wins it, they're not going to win it. What, what, who are they beating? They're not beating the Lakers. They're not beating the Clippers. And so, no, and here's the other thing. Pressure, I, I, I'm going to mess up the phrase, but pressure is the love child of expectations. Is that it? You know what I mean. It's something like that. Yeah. There's no pressure on James Harden because no one, no sober-minded basketball fan expects them to win. No one. If they get back and they win their first round, they get to the second round, lose to one of the teams from L.A. That's what we all expect, and that's what's going to happen. So, listen, I, this I, is it's ridiculous. Okay, but before we move on, just quickly here, I, I, I just want to say to America, Chris Broussard <laughs> and his love affair with the Los Angeles Clippers 
acting despite <laughs> all evidence that the Clippers have been a demonstrably better team than the Rockets this year is just baffling to me. The, I don't know that if, if you the Clippers and Rockets play each other, who has the best player on the court? Well, maybe the Clippers, but probably the, the Rockets. No, not Harden maybe. is certainly not okay. Maybe. maybe it is okay. Even if you believe that, so it's the fourth best players. player in the league against the fifth best player in the league. Who's the better number two option, Russ or Har or, or Paul George? I mean, you could argue Paul George. Russ is certainly more accomplished. By the way, the playoff Who's PG thirteen. The, the last time, the last time. Paul George won a playoff series, was 2014, by the way, America. That was six years ago. So everyone's like, oh, playoff P. He's been riding off the fact that he took LeBron six games in 2014 for a presidential term and a half. <laughs> That's neither here nor there. So this idea that we can just cross out the Rockets, Jenna, I think is nonsense. Are they my pick? No. Are they the favorite? No. But, Jenna, you can't just cross them off. So then let me ask you guys this a different way. Whose fault is it then that James Harden hasn't won yet? Is it his style of play? Is it the way he has often been criticized for playing in the postseason? Or is it like what Daryl Morey said, that maybe he himself hasn't put the right team around James Harden? Broussard, I'll kick it to you. Look, Daryl Morey, he's made some mistakes. But he's given James Harden, Dwight Howard, Chris Paul, and now Russell Westbrook. So, and they've always had a nice cast of role players, okay? Harden has not gotten it done at times in the playoffs. We all know that. You know, when you, go, you can go way back to Nick mentioned his first trip to the finals with OKC. He didn't play well. Even though he was a third banana, he didn't play well in that series. We can go to 2018. That Rockets team was good enough. They had the Golden State Warriors with Kevin Durant down three games to two, it's not Daryl Morey or James Harden's fault that Chris Paul got hurt and, and didn't play the last two games. Maybe they already have a championship if Paul isn't injured. But then in tw last year, they had their shot, right? And, 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 and uh, Kevin Durant gets hurt in game five, and James Harden and Chris Paul cannot lift them past an uh, injury-ravaged Golden State team. So I put most of it on Harden. Not saying he's not a great player. It's just tough to win a championship. But uh, I, I don't put it on Daryl Morey in this case. It, it's on Harden because he's had some struggles in the playoff. The defense of Morey is, in 2018, they were the best team in basketball. Better than a team that a lot was the defending champ and a lot of people thought was the most talented team ever, the Warriors team. They won more regular season games, they're up 3-2, to two, and their second best player pulls his hamstring and it's a wrap for them. Now, they still could have won game 6, they were up 15, game 7, they were up 15. But I just want to say a couple things about Harden in his defense. Harden did have some awful playoff moments early in his tenure with Houston. In 2015, he had two of them. He had the come back against the Clippers in the second round where he was on the bench for it. And then in the next round against Golden State in the closeout game, he was two for 11 with 12 turnovers. But that was 2015. Since then, James Harden has only had one truly awful playoff moment, a game where I believe and I, I have reason to believe he played with a concussion game six against the Spurs in 2017 when he was two for 11 against an undermanned Spurs team and he looked totally out of sorts because he got concussed in the previous game. Aside from that, he's been fantastic in the postseason. His regular season averages are 29, six and eight on 44%. His playoff averages are 28, six and seven on 41%. And Jenna, just like you earlier said, when a guy gets called injury plagued, whether it's true or not, it just sticks with him. If you're called a guy who can't get it done in the playoffs, it just sticks with you. So Broussard, before we break, I just want to show you something real quick. Here's two numbers. Here's two sets of stats. You tell me who you think was better in these two if we can put it up. Well, this it does give it away a bit here, but this is both against the Warriors. Two different rounds. One guy averaged more points on a better percentage, more assists, slightly fewer rebounds. Can we show who those people are? Harden and Kawhi. Okay. 
Kawhi gets finals MVP against a beat-up Warriors team and is called a playoff killer. Harden gets said he choked again against a Warriors team that, for the most part, Broussard was healthy for the first five games of that series. Like, that, those numbers to me have to mean something as far as how we evaluate how each of those guys played and the results-oriented analysis we do. Look, I don't rip Harden as a guy that can't get it done in the playoffs. All I'm pointing out is that he has had his moments where he has struggled in the playoffs in critical moments. And uh, like you said, last year when Golden State was hurt, they he didn't get them over the hump. That's all I'm pointing out. I've said the same thing as you. He's been terrific at times in the playoffs, and, and most recently he's always played well. However, you what you forgot with your, your stats right there is the other side of the basketball, defense. And that's where Kawhi Leonard is definitively better than James Harden. And so I would take Kawhi as a better player than James Harden. And obviously, I think he was better against the Warriors than James Harden, no matter what the stats say, offensively. Yeah. Uh, all right, guys, we're going to have to leave Jordan it there. Bell. Talk some Lakers now, where LeBron James could be on the verge of playing with the best big three of his career. Nick's still mumbling under his breath, and will continue to do so as we break. Next uh, on First Things First. Last time Clippers played the Rockets, Kawhi was standing. All right, guys, time for stores to start your morning sponsored by Midas. Trust the Midas touch. We are hearing that next year's NBA schedule could be condensed to try to maintain the league's timeline. That could mean more back to backs, more four games and five night type situations. Nick, what do you make of that? Yeah, I don't think that's a good idea. I think that if you do, we already have led by the reigning finals MVP and the, you know, Broussard's great, great friend, Kawhi Leonard, an epidemic of sorts of load management. And if we start playing four and five nights and back to backs, it, it, listen, the best players in the league are only going to end up playing 65 to 70 games anyway. So might as well get the season back on schedule if you need to and just make it a 65 to 70 game season. So I, I don't like this idea, Wilds. Yeah, there's zero chance there's going to be more back-to-back. -back. Michelle Roberts is going to crush that. Here's what's going to happen. They're going to condense the season, but then where's all the money go? Everyone's looking at her like, hey, we need more money. The COVID really, uh, really put a hurt on our financials. So in order to make up that money, Broussard, I think we're going to see one of these uh, 8, 9, 10 seeded tournaments to try to goose the pot a little bit. Uh, so I think that becomes a real thing next year. I think you're absolutely right, Wiles. There's no way I see them doing this without that type of tournament because, as you said, they're already taking a huge hit financially this year. And then to do that next year as well, there's, I just don't see the NBA or the Players Association allowing that to happen. Now, look, I've all, long been a proponent, maybe over the last 10 years or so, of making the schedule about 65 or 66 games. I think that type of yeah. season would be better. It'd be more of a sense of urgency. The games would be intense. And over time, you could eventually raise the ticket prices because the games would mean so much oh. more to make up for the loss in money. But you won't be able to do that next year. So I, I think the only way they do this is with a play in turn. Pick All right, let's move on to the Lakers now, who have reportedly shown interest in trading for Bradley Beal at different points. Think about that threesome. Broussard, would LeBron AD and Beal be better than Miami's big three of LeBron, Wade, and Bosch? It would be a better fit. You know, Beal with his jump shooting, AD obviously as a big man, and LeBron now playing the point, that would be a tremendous fit. The problem with Miami's big three, as great as they were, was they didn't fit that well together. LeBron and Dwayne Wade were a, a little bit redundant, uh, but obviously they still were a, a great trio. But where they would have the, the advantage for the Heat is in a few places. One, this Lakers group would not be as good defensively, largely because LeBron is older, and that's the second thing. LeBron was just better in Miami because he was still physically, you know, at his peak, and he was more athletic. But this would be a tremendous big three with the Lakers, one that would, would be the favorites to win the championship without question. Nick, I'm gonna call into your radio show today, Mad Dog Sports, I think it starts at six o'clock, and I'm gonna propose this trade. And, I, and I'm gonna say, like, yeah, the Lakers should get Bradley Beal. Who are the Lakers giving to the Wizards to get Bradley Beal? Who do the Wizards want for Beal's huge contract? I have no idea how this would work. 
Well, first of all, I appreciate the plug for the radio show. It was very kind of you. You're welcome. Second of all, you are abs- both of you are absolutely right. Broussard is right that this would be a better fit than the fit in Miami. And if Le- listen, LeBron, if LeBron in Miami was a 99.5 out of 100, then right now he's downgraded to a 98.7 out of 100. That that downgrade's not substantial. But Bosch is at least. I'm sorry. Uh, Anthony Davis at this point is as good as Wade was, if not better, certainly than Wade was the last couple of years of that. And Bradley Beal's a far better fit. But Wilds, you're absolutely right. They, my commitment to take integrity demands, just like whenever people are like, hey, the Warriors are going to trade for Giannis. And I say, with what? You want Andrew Wiggins, Draymond Green, and a 2026 first rounder? Get out of here. The Wizards are not trading Bradley Beal for KCP and Kyle Kuzma and a 2028 first round pick. It's just not happening. If Beal's going to be a Laker, it's going to be in 2023 when he declines his player option and signs there. But it's not going to happen anytime soon. So, no, you're absolutely right, Wilds. All right, on to the Sixers. Check out Ben Simmons using quarantine to get swole. Join the club, buddy. Even our guy Nick's doing a couple of push-ups, like three or four a week. So we're all kind of on board. Hey, Broussard, you see Ben Simmons being the difference for Philly once the season restarts? Look, that picture is tremendous, but I'd rather see him with smaller arms, less definition, and shooting a jump shot. All right? I don't know. He's not going to play tight end. He's going to play basketball. No, they, they, Ben Simmons is not going to be the difference. Philadelphia is not mentally mature enough to win a championship yet. Uh, I don't know what's going on with Joel Embiid. I'm scared to think what his diet is like right now during this lockdown and what kind of shape he's uh. in. So I'm worried about the Sixers. And they still haven't figured out how to maximize Ben and Joel together. That coaching staff hasn't done it. So, no, look, they're talented, but they won't come out of the East. Hey, I I like this. Broad Street Bullies, let's rumble. I love the Sixers to the finals, best home record. And Nick, you should talk to your guy, Rich Paul. They're both clutch guys. We get a ton of LeBron working out pictures. We don't get a ton of Ben Simmons pictures, so maybe get a few more coming down the Instagram. Well, I'm, I got two quick points here. One is poor Ben Simmons. There's, oh, hey, Joe Kim Noah. Wait a second, Joe Kim. Poor oh, Joe ben Kim Simmons, Noah. Boom, right into the can, show. There's nothing, <laughs> there's nothing Ben Simmons can do on Instagram that makes us happy. If he puts up videos of him shooting jump shots, we say do it in the game. That's if he true. puts up videos of him working out, we say take jump shots. Secondarily, and maybe more importantly, for the folks that are watching in Fox Sports HR, as requested, that was the fourth time you said it would take four times of Jenna Wolf body shaming me on camera for there to be some type of what? repercussions. So I, now it's happening. That is and not the, body uh, shaming. Consider this my, offi- I said consider you're this doing- my official complaint Nick? being filed. Nick? Jenna? Jenna? The you're tape doing speaks three for itself, Jenna. A week the tape speaks is for itself. not body shaming. Jenna? The tape Three speaks for itself. week, not body shape. <laughs> All right, we got a little preview of Joe Kim Noah. Here he is. He's ready for a title shot with his Clippers. In other news, Joe Kim Noah joined the Clippers back in March. Show of hands. Who knew that? I didn't either. Don't worry. Joe Kim said this yesterday about his L.A. team. I'm in an environment now with a winning culture and a team that's really trying to win a championship, and there's not much more I could ask for. Regardless of what my role is, I'm grateful I know I'm as ready as I can be. Nick, what impact will Joe Kim Noah have on the Clippers title chances? Well, none whatsoever. And, you know, Broussard's got this team, I think, sweeping every round of the playoffs, yet they keep adding guys because they don't think they have enough. But Wilds, really good news for Joe Kim. Came down yesterday, not going to be testing for recreational drugs in the bubble, so that should probably help his ability to stay on the team. But, no, I, I, he's not going to make any impact on the court. No, oh, I think it's just like how that quote panel popped up in the last question. You never know how he's going to show up and affect the game and and, dis, and disrupt things, Broussard. I love Joe Kim Noah as a player, love him as a guy, and I love that he talks trash to Cleveland, your uh, hometown. Yeah, I do. Despite his feelings about Cleveland, I do like Joe Kim. He'll bring great spirit, enthusiasm, 
to that team. He's not going to play much. Nick is right mm -hmm. about that. He can't oh. bring much on the court anymore. He's 35 years old, hasn't played all season. But if you need him in a pinch to go in there and defend the big, you get some fouls off of him, you can do that. But yeah, Joe Kim, this is not much of a basketball move. All right, let's end the program like we always do with some fishing. Check out Michael Jordan and his Catch-23 team that reeled in a 442-pound marlin during an ongoing North Carolina fishing tournament. Broussard, I bet, MJ bet, he could reel in the biggest catch. Well, it just, just proves he's not only the goat of basketball, he's the goat of fishing, nice. too. All right? Everything. Yeah, he loves yeah, I know that. Just like he loves golf, he loves fishing. This is real. Yeah, you know, Nick, um, a lot of there's been a lot of talk in the fishing community. Jordan's fish weighed 442 pounds. There was another fisherman yeah. that brought in a fish half that size, but he had several on the hook that jumped off. He, they, they weren't able to reel in. And some people are saying that person deserves credit. So I think this is your type of fishing tournament. <laughs> I couldn't get through it. Listen, uh, <laughs> listen, it was a great, it was almost a great bit, Wild. Uh, credit to Michael Jordan. And by the way, I know we only have 20 seconds left in the show. Breaking news on this, ESPN.com just released their list of the five greatest fishermen ever. Number five, Ernest Hemingway. <laughs> Number four, Keith Van Dunn. Number three, Rick Clun. Number two, the great Rick Scott. And according to ESPN.com, greatest fisherman ever, Michael Jordan. Who knew? Greatest college player is. ever. Better passer True. than LeBron. You see what best, he's doing best here, Wilds, right? Ever. I, I heard he's the tallest player ever. Good for Michael. Left see you out. tomorrow, America. <laughs> Good for him. <laughs>